Welcome to Retail Connect 2018. I'm Carol Strohecker, Dean of the University of Minnesota's College of Design and home to the Retail Merchandising Program. The college brings together a full range of design disciplines, including retail merchandising, one of our largest majors. Retail merchandising is highly ranked among such programs in the Midwest and nationally. Elsewhere, much of retail education is focused on business. The University of Minnesota stands out in situating our retail program within a design college. Our graduates have a clear advantage having conducted their studies in the midst of a creative environment at a major research university. Our graduates are distinctive not only for their business acumen and knowledge of the retail sector, but also for their deep understanding of design thinking and their perspective on the importance of research to ground business savvy decision making. The College of Design community is excited to launch the new Center for Retail Design and Innovation located within our retail merchandising program. The center will foster collaboration with retail industry members to educate future leaders and address critical challenges in retail using a design thinking approach. Stay tuned for more information from the center's assistant director, Peggy Lord, about how you can get involved. As many of you know, this unique event emerges thanks to energetic collaboration across the College of Design, including faculty, advisory board members, student leaders, and alumni relations and advancement offices, staff in the Department of Design, housing and apparel, and many members of the retail industry whom you see here tonight. I'd like to take a moment to recognize and thank a few key people who helped make this event happen. Please stand or signal to us as I call out your names. Our planning team includes Director of the Retail Merchandising Academic Program and Director of the New Center for Retail Design and Innovation, Dr. Hae Young Kim. President of the Retail Merchandising Board, also an alumna and chair of this event, Jill Hamburger. <laughs> Teaching Specialist and Assistant Director of the Center for Retail Design and Innovation, Peggy Lord. <laughs> and our Director of Alumni Relations, Laurie Malberg. This planning team works closely with our retail merchandising faculty. Would all of you please stand? Retail merchandising faculty members, thank you. I would also like to thank the 3M Design Center. Earlier this year, I joined a group of students and faculty on a tour of the Design Center. This was an enlightening experience for all of us, culminating in tonight's keynote. I'd like to thank Eric Quinn, Vice President and Chief Design Officer at 3M for hosting that wonderful tour. And I'd like to recognize all of the 3M team members who are here this evening. Would you please stand as you are able? Thank you. Our retail merchandising advisory board members also play an important role, making connections and engaging many of the companies and professionals you see here tonight. Advisory more members, would you please stand or signal? Thank you. Serving in partnership with the advisory board are the members of our Retail Merchandising Student Leadership Board seated up front tonight. Would you please stand so we can thank you as well? <clears throat> the 
The Retail Advisory Board and its industry volunteers play a key role in the Retail Connect event. The Retail Advisory Board consists of important subcommittees who support student learning and industry connections. Tonight, I would like to recognize a member of our board with the Distinguished Advisory Board Member Award for her outstanding contributions to the program. This board member is a retail merchandising alumna and a longtime member of the Retail Advisory Board with more than seven years of service. She has made significant contributions to Retail Connect through her leadership of the Subcommittee for Board Engagement. Her knowledge of retail leadership in the school and passion for learning benefits students and faculty alike. This year, I am honored to present the award for distinguished service to Carrie Gilly. Carrie? I'll now turn things over to the Retail Merchandising Board President, event chair, and proud graduate of our Retail Merchandising Program, Jill Hamburger. Thank you, Carol. Well, welcome to Retail Connect 2018. Tonight we have over 300 attendees. I think that deserves a round of applause. We have an exciting program planned this evening with our keynote speaker, H.C. Shin, who will share insights on innovation and leadership in an era of disruption. But first, I'd like to recognize and thank some of our sponsors. Our first sponsor is Decor, who is a platinum sponsor. 3M, another platinum sponsor. Best Buy, a silver sponsor. And our bronze sponsors, Kohl's, Target, The Stable, Merchology, and the Design Student and Alumni Board. I'd also like to recognize and sh a shout out to our table sponsors, which is a new category this year, BTM Global, Deluxe, Made for Retail, and the U of M Patent Law School, as well as Victoria's Secret. Our gold promotional sponsor this year is Woodchuck. You can thank Woodchuck for the beautiful notebooks that are on your table this evening. The founders Ben and John are alumni of the University of Minnesota, and Ben was on one of our panels last year at this event. Not only are all of Woodchuck's products made in the USA, but they have a deep connection with nature. For every product that they make, they plant a tree. Last fall, on the University of Minnesota campus, Woodchuck planted their millionth tree along with President Kaler at his U of M residence, Eastcliff. I also want to give a shout out to the stable. The hint water on your table is courtesy of the stable. And I also want to thank MoMA. Hopefully you were able to hear his classical guitar performance during our reception. MoMA is a PhD student in the School of Music. I'd quickly like to go over tonight's agenda. In a moment, we're gonna break for a table talk, including introductions and a quick discussion at your table. It'll be followed by the main event, which is the keynote from H.C. Shin. After the keynote, we'll do another table talk and we'll have a second round where we'll discuss key learnings and develop questions for our Q&A. We'll wrap up the evening with 20 minutes of Q&A and some closing remarks from Peggy Lord, who is the executive, or the, excuse me, the assistant director of our new Center for Design and Retail Innovation. So let's get started. I'm going to introduce Rachel Dirksen, who is going to be facilitating all of our table talks this evening. Rachel.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Rachel Dirksen, and I am currently a junior in the Retail Merchandising Program, and I also serve as the president of the Retail Merchandising Advisory Board. So to start off this table talk, um, if you have not yet already introduced yourself to those sitting at your table, um, please take a second to do so. Also, please share your expectations for tonight's event. What are you hoping to learn, or how are you thinking this event um, and topic is relevant in today's retail landscape? All right, we will continue on. Perfect. All right, so to start off this table, oops, excuse me, now that you have had a chance to share your thoughts, um, if all the students in the room could please stand up for me. All right, and if you could now move to the table adjacent to you. Um, in doing so, we will have new students at every table and the retail industry professionals will be staying put in their current seats. Perfect, so now that you have a few new faces at your tables, um, please take a minute to introduce yourselves again um, to professionals sitting at your table and we will get started shortly after. Okay, we're gonna call to order now. So thank you, Rachel. I hope everybody's comfortable in their new seats. You probably didn't see that one coming. So in the spirit of innovation and disruption, I'd like to invite Daniel Gitsovich to the stage. Dan is the head of corporate strategy at 3M, and he will be introducing our keynote speaker this evening. Dan. Good evening. So thank you, Jill, and thank you to everyone for being here today. Um, my name is Dan Gitsevich. I lead corporate strategy at 3M. Uh, I'm actually an alumni of the University of Minnesota, so it's a real pleasure to be here today and introduce the keynote speaker. Um, it's hard to argue with the relevance of the subject of today's discussion, uh, innovation and leadership in an era of disruption. Uh, for business leaders, it's something you live every day. It's something you operate in. For students, it's something you'll be expected to navigate in pretty short order. So the question is, how do you prepare yourself for the uncertainty? And there are few people better positioned to provide a perspective on this topic than H.C. Shin. H.C. is a legend at 3M. Uh, he's got broad, diverse experience across geographies, markets, businesses around the globe. A very impressive resume. 30 plus years ago, HC started uh, in, at 3M in Korea, steadily rose through the ranks, acquiring a very particular set of skills. After roles in technical services and sales and marketing, he led 3M Philippines, and then he followed that up with running three of the most important global divisions in the company. He then led the industrial and transportation business group, the largest business in the company. And then he ran the entire international organization at 3M, which represents 60% of the company's sales. Uh, and that's about as global and diverse as it gets. HC is currently vice chair and executive vice president at 3M. In this role, he leads research and development supply chain, business development, marketing, and sales, information technology, and business transformation functions. Try to put that on a business card. <laughs> it's my pleasure to welcome HC to the stage so that he can tell you what it takes to lead and succeed in today's dynamic environment. HC? Thank you, Dan, for generous introduction. Good evening, everybody. Hope you are enjoying the starting of the great evening. Uh, so I have about 45 minutes. I'll make it concise, right to the point. Uh, subject is about innovation, leadership in this changing world, uh, disruption. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about 3M, 
Uh, and then a little bit of me, myself, uh, personal journey. Uh, I'm going through a lot of this actual kind of trench work at 3M, uh, including innovation, including disruption. Uh, so I'll share with you some of my experiences. I'll talk about change that's coming at us uh, at lightning speed. I also talk about uh, organizational readiness and response to the change that's coming. So there are a lot of subjects, but I think you, know, you can see a flow of ideas and thoughts uh, throughout the rest of the evening. So Dan talked about uh, my career in 3M, uh, and it's quite amazing. Uh, I was born and raised in Korea, joined actually 3M in Korea. Little did I know that time that after 34 years, I'd be speaking to you, the distinguished group, uh, tonight. A uh, couple of things. Uh, the country of the United States, uh, there's no country like this who accepts the people and gives the opportunity, uh, state of Minnesota. So I have, I have a lot to uh, thank for uh, the country. And then the company 3M, I cannot think of any Fortune 100 company who is so receptive to the talents uh, from anywhere around the world and giving them opportunity I ride up, ride up to where I am. It's kind of heavy, tired to carry, right? I mean, by, I mean but uh, you know, I, I'm thankful to the country and state and 3M uh, uh, every day. Uh, in addition to that, uh, frankly, I'm getting a lot of questions. Uh, you know, what's the secret and all that? Uh, apparently, I, I've done well in, in 3M. Um, there's no denying it. Uh, probably I'll give you maybe a couple of three things. One, as you saw, uh, I uh, moved my career from technical to sales and marketing very quickly in my career. In fact, I've done, I have a mechanical engineering degree. I've done mechanical engineering kind of work in 3M as a technical service engineer for one and a half years. Then I went to sales. That was like tectonic shift in, in what I was doing. I didn't know anything about sales. And then marketing. Uh, I didn't know much about marketing either. I think I had, for some reason, had that maybe inherited that kind of fear nothing attitude in trying new things or trying new functions. And part of it is because I was young. Uh, but I'm still trying to do that. I've said no to, in no occasion, I've said no to my job offer, as you see there. Uh, and then uh, the other thing, I guess, was the geography. So I moved from Korea to the Philippines to U.S. There's a lot of trepidation, family, and you know, particularly I was eldest son. So it's like a kind of deserting family, leaving country forever, right? You have dad and, and mom and all that. But for some reason, I did not have any fear of living in different countries and getting into that. So that was probably one of many things that I can share with you, that kind of fear nursing attitude in new things, trying new things. Secondly, I was seeking help all the time from other people. Mentors. I intentionally did that. When I came here, I intentionally decided to talk to people that I can look up to, and there are a lot of them in 3M, right? And that mentoring gave me a great opportunity. They opened the door for me, and they helped me through every step of my career. So I cannot overemphasize the importance of mentoring and mentee relationship. Third, I developed the habit of learning every single day because I found out quickly that unless I study, unless I learn some new things, including language back then, even today, I get behind. So I set the rule to set aside 90 minutes every day for my own learning. And I kept that practice for 30 years. I've done it this morning as well, about 90 minutes, read about different things and different technologies and so forth. One or two days doesn't make a lot of difference, but that accumulated habit becomes one month, two months, one year, 10 years. It makes a lot of difference. So I guess among other things, I'd like to give you those three. It's not a secret, right? Uh, but that was my, frankly, personal experience. So let's talk about changes. There are a lot of changes coming. Changes are very volatile, unpredictable, uncertain, very ambiguous. 
you know, not quite sure what's happening. Yeah, not very transparent, right? You really cannot get a handle of what the hell is going on, right, around the world. But that's the nature of the new world. The other nature of the new world is interconnectedness. Anything that happens in any part of the world affects everybody, including you and me. That's butterfly effect. So if you think about these two cataclysmic changes that's coming almost every day, and if you look at the, if you look at the pattern of changes, any big societal changes, comes kind of this way. It has incubation period, long incubation periods. Could take 10 years, sometimes 20 years. Who would have thought even five years ago, artificial intelligence can overtake human in some area, not all, by the way, like Go, uh, the traditional Asian game. Nobody would have even dream, dreamed of. But it came because change is coming in exponential way. It comes very similar to exponential function, like fx equals 2 to the power of x, or 3 to the power of x, exponential function, which is, if you look at the exponential function, it has long incubation period. Once it starts taking off, it really takes off. And the change is coming this way. If you look at the amount of information technology the, in, in terms of megabytes that we are dealing with currently versus 10 years ago, versus 10 years from now, people are thinking in about 12 years time, we'll have about 1 million more times of data than it's not 10 times or, or 20 times. How can, you, how can you even make stock of a million times more data? Why? Because it's coming that way. And most changes come that way, and most people, most organization, pass the inflection point without being prepared, whether you, you are individual, looking for jobs, or whether you're individual trying to be entrepreneur, or whether you are a company like 3M, I think this amount of change that's coming at us externally is one very, very critical thing to be aware of. And we have a lot of evidence of that exponential changes. You know, you, you, you can think about DNA. Uh, if you look at the uh, cost per gigabyte, gigabyte of data, uh, it is exponential. Actually, it is exponentially reduced. Uh, in fact, uh, this may be a bad news for our friends in uh, uh, Minnesota, by the way, uh, who makes uh, uh, memory, uh, Seagate. But Seagate is doing well in this day and age of rapid disruption. If you look at even some mundane product like solar module, the price of solar module has come down dramatically. It's not over one time or two times. It comes down 10 times, 15 times, and still keeps going down. If you look at the amount of bandwidth, it's growing at exponential rate. So you cannot imagine what's going to happen in this digital world 10 years from now, because it's coming at exponentially, at exponential way, and I think we are passing that point already. In fact, that red area, in terms of Internet of Things, we already passed that era, and everything is digital. We call it digital society, digital transformation, and digital revolution. There's no entity that's not affected by this cataclysmic change, including 3M. And we are already in that point of no return. A lot of people talk about singularity, loosely defined as the point where uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, will overtake human thoughts and intelligence. And everybody say, well, I mean, it's a good concept. It's not a concept. In some area, it's already happening. This happened three years ago. You know, people talk about chess being overtaken by AI and people, you know, kind of nod, nodded their heads, but not in this game, which is uh, probably one of the most strategic games that human being ever invented. Uh, it's the goal, very strategic move uh, in, in China and Asia. Uh, AI, in fact, Google's DeepMind completely 
overtook uh, the highest skilled player uh, you know, three years ago. And that gap is now so big uh, that actually that particular program, DeepMind, uh, Al you know, AlphaGo was the particular program that DeepMind has developed. Actually, AlphaGo retired uh, a couple of years uh, ago because, I mean, the gap is widening so much. And that's the characteristics of, uh, of, of the new world. In the last 100 years, everything was scarce. And human technology and productivity were designed to solve this problem. So if we can make more, that's good. Everybody benefits. And I think the human being did a remarkable job you know, achieving that goal, if you look at some of the statistics here. Now, not anymore. The problem is, Everything is too many and too much. And information is almost free and ubiquitous. If you look at Kodak film uh, 20 years ago, you know, uh, everybody was a little skittish in using many films, right? Because it was expensive. Now it's almost free. Statistics in Asia shows that typical child's birthday uh, parents uh, take about 482 uh, shots, uh, mostly using cell phones. So when you take 482 shots in one evening, the problem is not about uh, the film cost. It's about what to do with that 482, what to keep, what to throw away, and where to keep, right? That's different types of problems and issues and opportunities that's driven by this new phenomenon or new change. So in this new era, everything is ubiquitous, everything is abundant. And that's the characteristics of new era, which creates new opportunity for everybody. So if you look at all these changes coming to the organization and to individuals, it really boils down to how effectively we can respond. Individually, how, how ready are we for this digital revolution and digital transformation. Organizationally, how ready are we? That's the question that we are asking to ourselves every day. Because you may not like it, but you cannot avoid this. This revolution has been with us, with us already for quite some time, whether it's academic institution or the for-profit enterprises. So if we cannot avoid it, we better have to take advantage of it and that's the subject of my talk tonight. Because adapting to change and prosper, prospering in changing environment is not easy. This data was about 15 years old. Only 2.8% of companies created in the US can last more than 100 years. These days could be a lot less, maybe. So maybe, you know, 98% of the companies will go away after a certain period of time. Why? Because they cannot effectively respond to external challenges. The way, there's no other way of describing it. That's exactly the reason why. 3M, kind of quintessential North uh, Western Minnesota company, uh, joined uh, the illustrious ranks of Dow 30 companies. Uh, who makes up Dow 30 components, by the way, in August 9, uh, 20, that doesn't sound right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there, was, there was August 9, uh, there was about 42 years ago. Uh, so it must be in 1990-something. Uh, so about 42 years ago, 3M joined Dow 30 components. That time, Dow 30 components those companies make up uh, Dow Jones index that time. And how many companies are left? We have one, two, three, four, five, six companies. This was a couple of years ago. But as you know, DuPont was acquired by Dow Chemical. And GE, one time the paragon of American enterprise, was taken out of Dow 30 components about six months ago. In fact, G is in a lot of trouble. So you can really see about four companies, including 3M, lasted more than 40 years. That's the type of change that we are seeing, and the speed of change will continue to accelerate. 
And SRIM is doing well, even right now, after 116 years of existence. Not only are we doing well in returning the shareholder profit, but we are also quite popular among millennials. Actually, 3M was quite surprised to find out in a survey that was taken about two years ago that our company was selected as the most company, uh, the best company to work for among about 14,000 millennials. It's not just the US, but there are some international people who participate in the survey. And second place was Google. So actually, you're quite pleased and quite actually surprised why a company like 3M, after 116 years, is still admired by, by people like you, uh, millennials. And what makes company uh, like that? Uh, and if you think about uh, the opportunity or innovation in the context of, of the process, uh, you know, we talk about innovation, even, even design. Uh, there are two elements, uh, ideation element, in other words, what the ideas, and then execution element. Uh, in fact, uh, our experience in 3M is the quality of idea eventually determines the viability of success of that innovation. So spend a lot more time in ideation than actual execution. In fact, if you define the opportunity as an intersection between technology transition and demographic shift, there's a huge opportunity in front of us. We just don't know it. Amount of technical changes going through right now, it's not just AI or machine learning or all this new technology, but everything is changing accordingly. Uh, this speed of change is something that we haven't seen in decades. And we are right in the middle of the change. So by definition, there should be huge opportunity. Demographic shift, like China, freeing of people, almost 600 plus million people from poverty to middle class, huge opportunity. So if you look at technology transition that we are facing right now, there's a huge opportunity for any enterprise, small, medium, and large. Some know that change is coming and many don't. But if you look back at this era 10 years from now, we realize how much opportunity we were sitting and didn't know. Why? Because things are coming in somewhat kind of discontinuous way. So there's an innovation, and then innovation brings products and that product goes through optimization process. And at a certain point, there's another innovation coming. And you can see the curve that starts from that little Sony machine all the way to this day online music. So right now is the huge market discontinuity this time. And how can you take advantage of that? The issue that we are facing in our study and actual practice is our thinking. In most cases, organization is still organized in a linear way, the typical organization. But what's even more problematic, in my view, is linear thinking. So if you have linear thinking, trying to understand exponential change in linear organization, that's the mismatch. In fact, that's the mismatch in most organization. The linear thinking and linear organization trying to understand and respond to exponential change that's coming externally and trying to even make some sense of it, that's the guts of issue. In not only survival and the prosperity of any organization. So if external change is coming exponentially, our response has to be at least exponential. So what are the characteristics of organization or the team that's effective in responding exponentially? In fact, there are several points. If you look at the point number one, uh, whether we like it or not, every industry is disruptive digitally. 
So if you look at digital revolution and disruption, it's not done by our similar competition. It's generally done by information-based new entities, and we have seen this over and over again in tax industry and re in retail industry as well. And this type of from left field type completely new uh, co competition equipped with information-based technology will continue. So if we cannot disrupt our own business, we'll be disrupted. And there's no other way of putting it. We simply think that disruption has to be one of our vocabularies and one of our key components of innovation. And this new team and the new thinking, they thrive in this world of abundance and the ubiquity of information and open nature of infrastructure. Because information is rapidly approaching to zero in cost. So there are organizations who is very, very good at that. And those are the people who disrupt our business. And their level of risk, risk taking is very different. We think we are taking some risk by you know, signing some team members and some budget. And their level of risk taking is very, very different. So unless we understand where they're coming from, we'll uh, probably find ourselves behind the eight ball pretty soon. You know, traditional concepts like assets are changing rapidly. So what are the assets in traditional business definition? People, uh, inventory, maybe uh, capital, especially capital uh, assets. Uh, 3M makes tapes, right? Uh, say customers are wanting a lot more tapes. Uh, but we cannot sell more tapes unless we build more plants, right? So in a way, our growth is constrained by our supply chain capability, particularly physical assets. You know, we have some great business that we can grow faster, but we need, we need about 200 employees. We cannot hire them overnight. So growth is also constrained by the number of employees, the skill sets we can hire. So most traditional business, including us, has what we call constraint fa factors. And these new entities completely ignore that constraint factor. So if you look at, say, Uber, so what is the asset? Uh, vehicles, right? The Uber drivers. Uh, that's Uber asset for a certain duration of one, one day. Could be two hours, right? But Uber really doesn't need to spend a lot of money in buying vehicles. The drivers bring the assets. So in a way, in new era, rather than owning the asset, we either lease the asset or use somebody else's asset. So that effectively removes the constraint of asset. The other thing is they remain very agile and very adaptive to technology like cloud. So the era that big corporation owns its own data center is probably gone. So why own your own data center where, where you, can, uh, in, uh, you can use a cloud service, for example? So the reason that these new companies can grow wildly is because there is no constraint in assets, in people, or physical assets. That's why companies like Uber, Alibaba.com can grow so fast. But for the large organization, this is very problematic. Can it really can you really import that type of practice into large organization? And that's what we are discussing almost every day in 3M and, and all the companies who are participating here. Can you really create small teams within large organization and empower them, okay, and ask them to be agile and responding to those disruptive ideas? That's fundamentally the role of leadership. If leadership doesn't take the lead in making this happen, that's not going to happen. Because you all very well know that these days, fast horse is important. At the same time, completely different dimension of disruption is what it takes. Even Kaizen, continuous improvement, can get you so much. Unless you 
have your own disruptive ideas to disrupt your own business. And there's a difference between doing things better through continuous improvement, Lean Six Sigma, all that. But that type of continuous improvement is a diminishing return at a certain point, as you can see in this curve. So it has to be augmented by another disruption at a certain period of time. But if you think about the ideal combination, we think it is the combination of machine uh, processing power and human creativity. Even 100 years from now, machine cannot replace human imagination and creativity. You know, for example, design is probably another angle. We can use computing power in certain aspects of design, but when it concerns imagination and creativity, this is the area that we still need human being. Not only do we still need human being, as age becomes more digital, human's role and leadership's role is becoming even more important. Because the key word here is judgment. Machines cannot replace human judgment. A lot of what I'm doing in my current role is to make the judgment. We have a lot of data coming at my desk. The data to prove that certain theory is right. Another group coming with the data to prove the same phenomenon wrong. So somebody has to make a decision, right? So they use machine learning to, to come to an entirely different conclusion. And that's where human judgment comes into play. And that's why leadership and judgment is so important. So if you think about AI, for example, so it's a paragon of AI. You can say Google, right? Uh, maybe IBM uh, made a big bet uh, uh, in AI. Uh, uh, but SoftBank is arguably one of the uh, paragons in this new era of AI. How many of you heard of SoftBank? Raise your hand. So about one third. This is Japanese company, by the way, uh, founded by uh, Masayoshi Son. And he's probably the richest person in Japan. Uh, he uh, created a venture fund for AI, just one subject, AI. Uh, and his venture fund uh, was uh, $100 billion. And that $100 billion is bigger than all venture funds in the whole world combined, including those in the United States and Europe. So he got $100 billion to spend on AI. And he used about one third of his own money, which is about 30 plus billion. So you know that he's at least richer than 30 billion, right? So how can a person amass that much mass of, of, of wealth? You know, uh, this guy. But that's my second point. My first point is Toyota announced alliance with SoftBank. So Toyota is a paragon of analog world, right? Quality, you know, including, frankly, some design features, arguably one of the best companies in making vehicles. But Toyota realized that they cannot do everything themselves, especially in this new era of autonomous driving. So they decided to team up with what they think is the best company in doing so, and that was SoftBank. So they are going big time, to provide autonomous driving service. We think this type of combination of some uh, digital-based company, internet-based company, and subject matter experts like Toyota, we still need that. Without domain expertise, the digital information can be very hollow. And just domain knowledge itself, without combining it with digital capability, can be outdated. So future collaboration will be more and more like this. The company who is very good at what they are doing, without abandoning their core, indeed in this case, they make great cars. That's their core. And they team up with somebody like SoftBank to create autonomous driving. So that combination of domain expertise and digital capability, we think, 
is the winning formula. Now, next story is about how Masayoshi's son uh, amassed so much wealth, among other things. I mean, he uh, set up the company uh, in Japan, actually a telecom company uh, called SoftBank, by the way, uh, and they eventually unseated uh, what was the biggest Japanese telecom company, Docomo, NTT, as number one. Uh, that's part of how he made such a big money. Uh, but there's another one. Uh, there's almost in inflection point of his wealth. And that was the meeting uh, between Masayoshi's son and Jack Ma in Japan. And folklore goes that uh, uh, Masayoshi's son was playing golf with Jerry Yang, who was the founder of Yahoo. And uh, Jerry Yang goes, you know, Masayoshi, uh, I don't know about this kind of crazy guy from Hong Kong who kind of kept badgering me about this new idea that doesn't make any sense uh, about some kind of e-commerce or something in China. Uh, so I'm done with him. So, but if you're interested, uh, I can get him introduced to you. So uh, right after the golf game, they met at the clubhouse of one golf course in Japan. And in that meeting, uh, Masayoshi son gave $20 million uh, to what is now Alibaba.com uh, in exchange for 30% of the company. So that was 2000, so only 18 years ago, 20 million investment. And in 2014, when Alibaba was taken to IPO, initial valuation became about $170 billion. And Masayoshi got one third of that. And that was about $58 billion return from 20 million. I think this could be probably one of the biggest return in any human history. Uh, so what, and what, if you think about what Jack Ma said there, and not even talk about business model, not even ask a lot of questions, it's about sharing the vision. So in this new era, even investment becomes very different, risk taking. Uh, becomes very, very different. So maybe a couple of lessons here, maybe be open to new ideas, uh, you know, remain visionary maybe, and maybe have lunch with somebody else other than you. Uh, maybe some of those lessons, I guess. Because in the organization, the issue is how we can keep people like this. Because one person's one idea can create huge business, can disrupt the entire world. Jack Ma's e-commerce idea was that. Jeff Bezos' similar idea was that. One person's one idea can change the whole world. And because of that, how can we preserve and protect those ideas coming from somewhat kind of geeky, wacky people. Okay, in large organizations, we call them high maintenance, by the way. <laughs> uh, because, I mean, they are really difficult to keep. I mean, they always have different opinion, right? But unless we keep this type of people and their ideas, disruption will not come. So as a manager of large organization, uh, this is the conundrum, how we can keep these ideas flowing, how we can maintain these people in the organization. So what does it take to make it happen? Because there is a antibody to change. Any innovative ideas, innovation, immediately comes to this point of rejection before it even becomes commercialized. So, hence the role of leaders. There's no other way but saying that only leaders can create this environment where ideas freely flowing and somewhat kind of a wacky ideas not only survive but prosper in the organization. How can we make that happen? And that's why in our leadership 
discussion, we define one of the most important roles of leaders is to lead the change and nurture innovation. It's not about asking managers to be innovative themselves. It would be good if they can do that, but at least nurture the environment where innovation ideas can flow. And that's, frankly, the organizational challenge. I'm sure a lot of you read about this, what we call McKnight HR principle. If you read it today, it looks contemporary. And this was 70 years ago, 1948. 1948. And that's why organizations like 3M can last long time because of that type of spirit. And I'm still trying to embody that spirit in a modern way, in a different way. But that fundamental core spirit hasn't changed it. And that's the role of leaders. So how can we create this type of modern heroes? So these are researchers, scientists, who doesn't have a lot of interest in managing big organization or big title, but they just like researching. You know, I mean, in many cases, their research room is located in the basement. And even during frigid Minnesota winter, they love to have a half sleeve uh, shoebox. But that's where these heroic ideas come from. And we are very happy and very satisfied to have many entrepreneurs and innovators like uh, Scott and Andrew. And that's why in 3M, we have what we call leadership behaviors. So we want all leaders to behave certain ways. And there are six. Number one is to nurture innovation. If the leader or manager cannot create the environment of innovation, then all best are off. So we encourage, we assess managers this way. But at the same time, the way that we assess people, just in case you join large organization these days, yes, we assess leadership behaviors. But at the same time, short-term performance is also very important. So you put it x-axis and y-axis. So you are in one of the quadrants, OK, not just certain point. But we assess people in at least two dimensional, if not three dimensional way. So that if you plot this over time, in several years, you pretty much know what that person can, can do and can't do. So I think this technique has become very popular in many organizations. But we are still using this as the key way to assess our people. And that's how this disruption comes into play. So we have technology platform. We bring humanity's issues and, and problems and create solution that's new to the world. But there should be some fundamental skill sets. In case of 3M, that is our core technologies. You cannot just go out and try to solve world's problems without your own capability. And for us, that is our technology platforms. And we have 46. So if you apply that 46 technologies and scouting the problems that humanity is facing and all the technical changes that's going, that's how this innovation model actually works. I think many of you are familiar with this model. We are still practic practicing this model. And that's still the core of 3M innovation. And that's why one technology can spawn a myriad of applications and products. And this is still happening in 3M. Before I close, I'd like to uh, share the example of Post-it story. Uh, a lot of people think it's a great invention. It was a uh, great technical uh, discovery of particular adhesive that can stick in the surface. And uh, if you detach, there's no residue. Uh, which is true, uh, but it's more about marketing uh, story than technical. Uh, because uh, original researcher, uh, Dr. Spencer Silva, was trying to uh, invent the adhesive that's like Grimdes, a very, very strong, almost structural adhesive. And he failed. 
In fact, the adhesive that he, uh, he uh, discovered was so weak that it actually detaches from the surface. So instead of throwing away, he kind of shelved his idea in his lab notebook. And then about six years after that, here comes another gentleman by the name of Art Fry, who is generally known as the inventor of post-it notes. Art Fry was the member of uh, church choir, singing. Uh, you, you need to look at the hymnals. And in different pages of hymnal that you have to move through, you find it very difficult to find out which hymnal page he was in and how quickly he can find it. So he was discussing this problem at lunch with Art Fry and with Dr. Silver, Spencer Silver. And Spencer said, you know what? I may have something for you. And that was the origin of post-it notes. So it was more serendipitous marketing, application innovation, than a huge technology discovery. But we still maintain very high market share even after 40 years after we introduced post-it notes. A lot of people think that we still own a lot of patents, which is true, but a lot of those patents have expired. You have only a certain duration of time for patents to, to be effective. But during that time, 3M also invested in brand, post-it notes. So while we have patents, we invest in brand, but by the time patent expires, we still have brand. So there is a survey that many customers feel guilty of not using 3M post-it notes or using slightly cheaper notes, and that's the power of brand. So there's another story about in, in innovation, not necessarily coming just from product technology, but it can be certain application. It could be certain marketing ideas. So innovation can happen in every business process. Again, talks about the importance of having lunch with somebody other than you, right? So a couple more minutes. So a lot of companies are investing a lot of money in product technologies and technology itself. Uh, that's the trend. But actually, value creation comes in other areas than product and technology, as you can see here. Could be marketing innovation, could be logistics innovation, or could be supply chain innovation. So that's why we view innovation from 360 degree angle, not just product technology or, or process technology. So when you talk about innovation, we have to look at it uh, holistically from all angles of our business process. So a uh, famous uh, a quote from 3M here, uh, innovation is a combination of nurturing culture and process. And it's about people, it's about leadership, it's also about vision and passion for changing the world in this rapidly changing society. So that was my quick 40-some uh, minutes talk. Uh, I know we have some another table talk and some uh, Q&A, I guess. Uh, but uh, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak in front of you. Uh, and to the students, I wish you well. Uh, if you look at the economy in the United States, you cannot be at a better place at a better time here. So you should feel very fortunate about it. I want to thank all of our partners. Uh, the 3M is grateful for your partnership. Uh, and our customers as well here uh, to tonight. Also, I'd like to thank uh, University of Minnesota uh, for such a great source of uh, talents and ideas for 3M for so many decades. So thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Shin. Um, we hope you all enjoyed this presentation, and now we invite you all to take the next five to 10 minutes for a brief discussion at your tables focused on your takeaways from the presentation, as well as to jot down any questions you'd like to ask during the Q&A.
All right, we're ready to start tonight's Q&A. We're gonna take about 20 minutes. There'll be two students in the audience with microphones. So if you have a question, raise your hand and somebody will bring the microphone to you. So um, we're ready to go. My name is Susan Firestone and I'm a freelancer. Um, my question, and actually several at the table had this questions. Um, how do you decide what to study in those 90 minutes? <laughs> so uh, uh, these days, particular technology topic uh, around uh, machine learning and AI. Uh, uh, it can be China uh, was my topic for three straight years. So each year I select about three subjects that I want to dig deeper and concentrate on it in addition to kind of daily reading of journal and you know, financial times and so forth. So uh, each year I select about three areas that I want to dig deeper uh, and concentrate my reading on those. If you do it for 365 days, I bet you make a lot of difference uh, in doing so. So instead of trying to read everything, uh, I select maybe two or three uh, per year and trying to become pretty deep in that particular uh, area, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Angela Whitrock and I'm new to 3M in the last three months. Uh, oh, great, so welcome. I'm, <laughs> yeah, so I'm curious from your years of experience if you could share an example of when 3M has waited out kind of that disappointing phase of the exponential curve um, until it reached the point where it really takes off uh, because it seems like sometimes projects can kind of get killed in that disappointment phase uh, before it reaches the point of exponential growth. Right. So 3M also has seen those phases. If you look back the last 30 years, there were at least maybe two or three times that we found ourselves at kind of at the trough, at the bottom. Not a lot of new products. Uh, things were slowing down. Growth is stalling. We, we see that. In fact, I think any organization will see that type of period where ideas are dwindling. And for whatever reason, things are not just working out. Um, and I think, you know, that time, uh, I remember uh, what uh, uh, our predecessors did that time. And I was part of two out of three, uh, those kind of a bottom periods in, in 3M, is what we call a confronting the reality session. Uh, in my memory, we had uh, several of those sessions. These are very intense sessions. Uh, last one I remember was about 10 years ago. Uh, in Holiday Inn, right across 94 from 3M. Uh, it was uh, led by, at that time, my boss, uh, who was leading 3M's industrial business. Harold Wins, by the way, was the name. And he told us, uh, you know what? Uh, we have a lot of these quality issues that are basically ruining our business. Uh, I never knew how seri serious it was until I actually visited a lot of customers and listened to their pains and problems. And then he asked all of us to go out and spend more than half of our time visiting, visiting those customers who go through the pain and making that pain kind of visceral, making that pain personal. So about two months after that, we reconvened in the same place. And the conversation was very different. So, so to me, the key during tough time is to confront and face the reality as it is, and bring a lot more candor into the conversation. And then you experience it viscerally and personally. To me, that's the best antidote to uh, dig out of holes. In fact, I cannot imagine the amount of energy we created after that, because I know the pain. Not that I didn't, but there's a difference between you know through PowerPoint slide versus you actually, you go to the uh, tinge area that customers are doing their grinding work, whatever work they do, and feel it, right? So I cannot overemphasize the leaders and all of us to be at the trench and really feel the reality of situation uh, instead of just listening through somebody else. So that visceral and personal experience 
to me goes a long way in business and elsewhere. Hi, my name is Chris with Best Buy. Good to see you again. Okay. Um, one of the slides you had uh, caught my attention. It said, innovation is not an accident. It's driven by a system of culture and processes. And I was wondering if you could share some examples of how you create and nurture an innovative uh, uh, process and culture within right. your organization. So we talked a lot about culture, right? Culture is more about ideation process to make sure that we uh, encourage as many ideas as possible, including wacky ideas. So we need more ideas. That's basically nurturing the culture part of it. Create an environment where ideas flowing freely. Many, many, many ideas. More ideas, the better. There's no bad ideas. At that ideation stage, that's what we need in terms of culture of innovation. Many, many ideas. That alone may be necessary, but not sufficient. There's about half of the equation. Because you cannot possibly try all those ideas unless you put your company to bankruptcy next month, right? So the unknown part of 3M innovation is how rigorous we are in putting all those ideas through the hopper, through the prioritization, almost ruthless prioritization, so that we only bet on some highly qualified ideas. So that's what we call process. And then put in place the funding mechanism to make sure that eventually we bet on some really good and qualified ideas. So that's why we have to combine this culture who attracts a lot of ideas and process who turns ideas into commercialization. I told you about the fact that R&D is the business of turning data and knowledge into useful information. And innovation is a process to turn that useful information to money and commercialization. The innovation is deeply rooted in commercialization. That's why, frankly, more qualified ideas may not be product ideas. It could be marketing ideas. It could be design ideas. It could be supply chain ideas. In fact, I think more innovation is coming from those non-product, non-technology areas than product and technology. I'm Grace Burleson, a student at the U, and our table was wondering, in the emerging consumer landscape where consumers are beginning to be aware of and value sustainability, how does 3M incorporate sustainability into its projects to capture this market? I mean, that's a great point. Uh, sustainability uh, is not only a big emphasis, but uh, we bet most of our future innovation on sustainability. And it's not just about uh, quintessential product sustainability. It's about everything that surrounds the manufacturing, packaging, uh, including raw material and everything. Uh, so uh, we are uh, deadly committed to uh, sustainability. In fact, uh, recently, uh, we are stepping it up. Uh, there are some goals that we set out uh, 20 years ago. We overachieved those goals, like greenhouse gas emission and so forth. And now we are expanding uh, the definition of sustainability to encompass areas that we didn't uh, pay a lot of attention in the past, uh, like volatile organic compound, the smells, uh, the uh, trace of certain materials that we do not want to be present in, in consumer packaging, for example. Or the adhesives that came from bio-based material instead of synthetic or NAFTA. Uh, or uh, the innovative ways to reduce the packaging material and the use of plastic uh, in half or even more. So it, it, it brings all this innovation to bear in the areas of product design, uh, manufacturing, uh, disposal of, of used materials, and packaging. Uh, so it is a very, very critical part of 3M's strategy going, going forward. Hi, I'm Liz. Um, I'm a student at the U. I was wondering what adjustments you would advise people who fall into the linear thinking model so that they can embrace and incorporate exponential changes within their business? So I guess uh, the big part of it is to realize 
uh, how severe the changes are coming uh, and realize uh, what the external world looks like. Unless you viscerally and personally experience it, you never knew what's coming. In fact, that's why I encourage a lot of people to visit Shenzhen, China. Uh, if you go to Shenzhen, China, uh, you might see a very, very different things that you never even dreamt of uh, in Minnesota uh, or, or Wisconsin. The amount of startups there, the young people uh, sparkle in their eyes. Uh, innovative ideas all over the world. Entrepreneurs all over the world. Uh, and the size and scale of their bidding, uh, unfa you know, fathomable in, in some scale. Um, if you uh, really would like to uh, change from linear thinking to exponential, I highly encourage you to have some personal experience. And a big part of that is to go to industry like 3M or Best Buy or uh, those companies and learn uh, what type of, 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 of issues they're facing. Uh, also, I highly encourage people to travel. Uh, how many people have you uh, traveled to China personally? Raise your hand. Good, about half of you. I know China is far away, kind of expensive trip, uh, but I bet you it's worth it uh, to kind of open your eyes. And, and I think that's one way to, to change our thinking is through uh, personal interaction with other world and other people, uh, including industry. Uh, I, to me, that's the only way. I think learning will, will help, reading will help. Uh, but frankly, the personal experience uh, to me, it's the best way. Hi, I'm Elsie Driver. I'm with J. Crew. Um, you talked a lot tonight about innovating and being ready to take off with new ideas and disruption. Do you have anything to say in praise of maintenance or maintaining ways of doing things or systems to maybe be ready for the Absolutely. next change? Absolutely. I think it's a great point because I showed you the curve of better and different, right? Different is disruption. Different means innovation. Completely change the current process and product platform to be replaced. However, you have your business to run. You have your shareholders to, to satisfy. So what do you do with your existing business and existing process is equally or even more important. That's where process innovation, like continuous improvement, like Lean Six Sigma, come into play. In fact, what's the source of innovation is your existing business. If you do not have a good handle on your existing business in the form of enhanced productivity and efficiency, arguably, I submit that there's no money to be spent on innovation anymore. So the precursor to innovation in an organization is to create a space so that you can invest in new ideas, you can invest in new technology, and that creating space is called productivity programs. It is called continuous improvement. It is about Six Sigma and all of the above. So I think another fact that people somewhat uh, misconstrue uh, is existing business is not important. It's critically, critically important what you do with your existing business, because that's the source of money, frankly speaking, for innovation. But great point. Hi there, my name is Amanda Lai. I'm a retail consultant with Macmillan Doolittle. Uh, just based off of the overall discussion focused on disruption, I'm going to throw the crystal ball question at you. Um, based yeah. off all your learning and your expertise in the industry, what do you think is the next big thing in disruption? You know, I, I think obviously something digital. I mean, it is already coming as a tsunami, right? Um, uh, so I think clearly the trend of uh, digital transformation is here. Uh, personally, I think the uh, consumer's mindset toward uh, ours or the environment that they're living in, uh, it has been there for quite some time but I will expect a tsunami of attention, uh, probably 10, 50 more times of attention from consumers for anything that uh, relates to the health of this hemisphere and ours. I see that coming. 
I also see Africa uh, is not only waking up, uh, but becoming the force to be reckoned with. It's already happening. Uh, so I see Africa coming up. I see huge revolution of consumer mindset around environment, including climate change, in addition to digital revolution. I think this force uh, industrial revolution to me will continue. I think like machine learning, uh, AI, uh, IoT, uh, 3D uh, manufacturing, uh, I think we are still seeing an infancy of those technology and what those technology can do. Uh, we'll be amazed by what those can do for our life and our, our, our society. It's just amazing uh, change that I see coming. Hello, my name Hi. is Christina Johnson, and I actually work for the College of Design managing our mentor program. Okay. And you mentioned early on in your talk the importance of mentors. And this is sort of a personal question, but also in interest of my position. Um, how do you go about finding mentors, and then how do you approach someone and ask them to mentor you? Right, so in any organization, there are mentoring programs. Uh, they t tend to be a little bit more formal and to be very limited in numbers. So HR department can make kind of a match between mentor and mentee. Very small, uh, frankly, uh, population. So I think what's even more important is informal mentoring, uh, especially initiated by mentee themselves. Uh, most of my great mentor relationship uh, came from my own initiative. I told you about my fear nothing attitude. Same thing applies there. When I came to St. Paul here, uh, I got to know uh, exec one of the executive vice presidents. That time, I thought there was some kind of a, if there's a rank a little higher than God, I, th I think that's what that <laughs> rank was to me. It feels that way. So I barged into his office and say, uh, uh, in fact, his name was, was Mo, uh, Dr. Mo Nozari, say. Uh, Dr. Nozari, do you have some time? Uh, and before I uh, introduced myself, he knew me, you know. Oh, HC. Uh, that made things a lot easier. But that's how this mentoring relationship began. Uh, then he asked for monthly meeting over lunch. So I, again, importance of lunch, very important. <laughs> Most of my mentoring session came through lunch, by the way. So we have a lunch in different restaurants, and we talk about things, uh, different things. Uh, I, I found that invaluable throughout my career. So I cannot uh, overemphasize the importance of being courageous, uh, asking for uh, help. And most good managers will not decline the request. I never declined the request of at least having some audience with somebody who wanted to meet with me. Yes, I'm busy. So does that person. Everybody's busy, right? So I think if you really think your time is precious, you tend to uh, really appreciate those requests uh, coming. Uh, so I would say be courageous and, you know, the worst you can get is no, and that's okay, right? Uh, so I, I would say having that attitude of, uh, of seeking for help, and they will take it as the sign of passion they will take it as, as they take it as a sign of sincerity on your part, and those are the characteristics that we need in the organization. That's why you can get attention. We have time for one more quick question. Anybody else have a question? Well, with such a successful career, um, I'm wondering what do you consider yourself personally to be your biggest success? It could be professional, it could be personal, and if there is anything at all that you could do over. Or maybe there isn't, but if there was, what would you do over again? Or if I do over, I don't know, because, you know, the position I'm in largely exceeds my wildest dream uh, by a big margin already. Uh, so in that regard, I'm not looking for any bigger title, anything. The only thing I'm thinking about is giving back. Uh, I'm the product of my home country, Korea. Uh, Korea uh, grew me up uh, in that culture. 
so I am indebted to that country. I'm indebted to uh, United States and Minnesota uh, because I consider myself and probably most of you here as one of less than 10%, uh, less than 1% of your counterparts around the world that you don't know. The moment we think we are fortunate, uh, it gives a feeling of responsibility. Uh, if the people who are in that less than 1% or in you know, a small percentage uh, do not feel responsible for other people and the society is not good. Uh, so I'm making conscious effort to make contribution to here and country of, of, of Korea uh, and the United States. And there's a reason why I have a lot of small group meeting with companies and uh, students. Uh, when I go to Korea, uh, I normally stay about three days. Uh, one of my agenda is always to talk to uh, students and, and, and other, other companies because I think that's my small and humble way of giving back. And I continue to do that, uh, trying to give back as much as I can for those great things that I think I was uh, blessed with uh, from Korea and the United States. Thank you for asking. So how about a round of applause for Thank you. Sake. Thank you so much. So thank you for all your thoughtful questions. And as we close out the evening, I'm going to ask Peggy Lord, the Assistant Director of the Center for Retail Design and Innovation, to come up and give us some closing remarks. Peggy. Thank you, Jill. As Carol mentioned earlier this evening, we are excited to announce our Retailing Center of Excellence called the Center for Retail Design and Innovation. The CRDI is designed to enrich student experiences through industry partnership, collaboration, and involvement in the program. We are developing and launching various educational opportunities to support and empower retail merchandising students and the future leaders in our industry. There is information on the CRDI at your tables, and we are looking for industry partners to work with us on this exciting initiative. Please reach out to me if you are interested in becoming a founding partner or would like to learn more about it. Thank you for coming tonight. We really appreciate your time and sharing your um, business expertise with our students in the room. I hope you enjoyed your evening, were inspired by our speaker, and were able to make some new connections tonight. So as you leave, there is extra water in the room where you checked in. Feel free to grab a beverage as you um, head out tonight. So thank you again for coming. <laughs>